Welcome and thank you for joining me for today's exploration into the mystery of incubator babies. We have many different rumors mixed with supposed facts about what happened in history, about the development of the incubator, and then the display of many babies in incubators at World's Fairs and on Coney Island. Today's exploration, we're going to be examining these accounts and trying to determine exactly what happened, along with potential theories on what's behind the mystery of the incubator children. Let's go back to the beginning and look at the problem of premature and congenitally ill infants, which we're told is not a new one. Now, I've gotten away from looking at Wikipedia articles on the channel, but in this case, I'm going to make an exception because they have a pretty decent summary here. As early as the 17th and 18th centuries, there were scholarly, scholarly papers published that attempted to share knowledge of interventions. It was not until 1922, however, that hospitals started grouping the newborn infants into one area now called the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. NICU. Naturally, there's an acronym. Before the Industrial Revolution, premature and ill infants were born and cared for at home and either lived or died without medical intervention. In the mid-19th century, of course, when else would it be, the infant incubator was first developed based on the incubators used for chicken eggs. Dr. Stephen Tarnier is generally considered to be the father of the incubator, or isolette as it is now known. First I've heard that term having developed it to attempt to keep premature infants in a Paris maternity ward warm. Other methods had been used before, but this was the first closed model in addition. He helped convince other physicians that the treatment helped premature infants. France became a forerunner in assisting premature infants, in part due to its concerns about a falling birth rate. Interesting how we continuously hear about these concerns, and especially during that time frame. After Tarnier retired, Dr. Pierre Boudin followed in his footsteps, noting the limitations of infants and incubators and the importance of breast milk and the mother's attachment to the child. Well, I'm glad they noticed something that was so obvious. Boudin is known as the father of modern parentology. Oh, excuse me. Perinatology. There's all these great medical terms. I got to give them credit, though. They're a lot more creative than the architectural terms that we have. And what is perinatology? It is maternal fetal medicine. See, that's more of a descriptive term. And his seminal work, The Nursling, I'm not going to try it in French, became the first major publication to deal with the care of the neonate. Another factor that contributed to the development of modern neonatology was Dr. Martin Cooney and his permanent installment of premature babies in incubators at Coney Island. A more controversial figure, because what else would he be? He studied under Dr. Budin and brought attention to premature babies and their plight through his display of infants' as sideshow attractions at Coney Island and the World's Fair in New York and Chicago in 1933 and 1939, respectively. Infants had also previously been displayed in incubators at the 1897, 1898, 1901, and 1904 World's Fairs. So as you can see, we have something very suspicious going on here that warrants a deeper exploration. So now let's go to the Smithsonian Magazine, another one of our favorite, trusted, reputable sources of information, to look at the account of Martin Cooney, the man who ran a carnival attraction that saved thousands of premature babies, wasn't a doctor at all. Martin Cooney carried a secret with him, but the results are unimpeachable. Oh yes, it sounds so dramatic. Oh, and there's a picture of him right there, holding a child, premature baby who was on view at Coney Island attraction. An exhibition, no less. Nurses in starched white uniforms and doctors in medical coats tended to babies in glass and steel incubators. The infants had been born many weeks premature and well below a healthy birth rate. Stores didn't make clothes small enough to fit their tiny skeletal frames, so the nurses dressed them in dolls' clothes and knitted bonnets. A sign above the entrance read, Living Babies in Incubators, in letters so large they could be read from the other end of the Chicago World's Fairgrounds which took place over 18 months in 1933 and 1934. Always in Chicago, it seems. The infant incubator exhibit was built at a cost of $75,000, worth $1.4 million today, and was painted in patriotic red, white, and blue. And let's not forget what was going on in 1933 and 1934, the Great Depression, an event so terrible that Americans couldn't find work and people across the lands were suffering due to the economic depression the Great Depression, of which has never been seen before or since. 
The men in charge were leading Chicago pediatrician Dr. Julius Hess and Martin Cooney, who was known across America as the incubator doctor. Cooney was a lugubrious man, and that's a word you don't see often, an adjective that's not typically used. Basically, it means he's sad, or he appears sad. In his 60s, with thinning gray hair, a mustache and a stoop, something he jokingly attributed to a lifetime of bending over babies. <laughs> of course, Cooney and Hess employed a team of six nurses and two wet nurses. Martin Cooney had run infant incubator exhibits in which premature babies were displayed to the public for more than three decades, most famously at Coney Island in New York City. He had long been regarded by desperate parents as a savior, one who offered medical help to babies written off as weaklings by mainstream medicine. Little side note here, it should be noted that eugenics was really coming into the forefront, supposedly, in the early 20th century. And there were many doctors and part of the mainstream medical establishment, if there is such a thing, that stated that a lot of these infants should simply be left to die, because if they were allowed to live, it would weaken the species. No, this did not start in the 1940s with that terrifying regime that we hear so much about. This mentality started well before that. That's where that terrifying regime supposedly got the ideas. But who knows what the truth is? That's what we're told. But for Hess, who was accustomed to carrying out his work in a more conventional hospital setting, this was a career first. The exhibit was a hit with the Chicago public who paid 25 cents and flocked by the hundreds of thousands to see the babies. Why is that, one wonders. To celebrate the success of their facility, Cooney organized a homecoming celebration on July 25, 1934 for babies who had graduated from the incubators at the Chicago's World's Fair the previous summer. Of the 58 babies Cooney and Hess had cared for in 1933, 41 returned with their mothers for the reunion. The event was broadcast live on local radio and across the fairgrounds. Well, of course it was. On the radio program, Cooney's exhibit was portrayed by the announcer not as a frivolous sideshow spectacle, but as an invaluable medical facility. The incubator station for premature babies is not primarily a place of exhibiting tiny infants. Instead, it is actually a life-saving station where prematurely born babies are brought from leading hospitals all over the city just for the care and attention that are afforded. The place is spick and span with doctors and graduate nurses in constant attendance. Interesting, it almost sounds like a commercial for White Castle. Because of the sideshow setting in which he operated, Cooney's career had always been controversial. Well, of course it is. An effective doctor, that's naturally controversial. Many in the medical professional, many in the medical professional, hmm, interesting, viewed the incubator doctor with suspicion, others with outright hostility. <laughs> Wonder why. The New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children had repeatedly accused Cooney of exploiting the babies and endangering their lives by putting them on show. And is this the same New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children that advocated eugenics? Mm, mm, it's a discussion for another time. None of the complaints was sustained. <laughs> Who wrote this? And by the 1930s, Cooney was finally being taken seriously as a medical pioneer. Cooney's professional collaboration with Hess marked a key stage in his habilitation. Mm -hmm. But while doing research for my radio documentary, Life Under Glass, which is being broadcast on NPR stations around the country this August, and my book, Miracle at Coney Island, I made an incredible discovery about a man who has a claim to have changed the course of American neonatal medicine. Here it comes. Cooney was never actually qualified as a medical doctor. Throughout his career, Cooney said he had studied medicine in Leipzig and Berlin. However, I could find no evidence of Cooney, or Cohn Cohen as he was known then, having studied medicine at a university in either city. wonder why this is. To become a physician in Germany, one was required to write a thesis. <laughs> Things haven't changed that much at all, have they? The U.S. National Library of Medicine has copies of the German records. Librarians could not locate a thesis written by Cooney. And it's obvious it couldn't have been lost or anything like that. No, that possibility doesn't even cross the mind. Cooney was deliberately evasive about his date and place of birth. I have discovered that he immigrated to the U.S. in 1888 at 19 years old. And what evidence... Never mind. I'll stop asking questions. But someone at that age would not be old enough to have studied at university in Leipzig in Berlin before going on to do graduate work in Paris at the knee of Pierre Boudin. <laughs> Funny way to say it. The father of European neonatal medicine, as Cooney claimed to have done in numerous press interviews. In the 1910 U.S. Census, Cooney listed his career as surgical instruments, though Cooney claimed to be the inventor, excuse me, the inventor of an incubator. I have been unable to find any evidence that he registered an incubator patent in the U.S. More likely, Cooney was a technician. Yet by 1930, he was describing himself in the census as a physician. Oh, you imposter. Over time, the success of Cooney's facility began to attract the attention of some of America's leading pediatricians. Right up until the late 1930s, few American hospitals had incubators, so doctors sent premature babies to him. 
Very interesting. Interesting accounts. Cooney took in babies from all backgrounds, regardless of race or social class. A remarkably progressive policy, especially when he started out. He did not take a penny from the parents of the babies. In 1903, it cost around $15, equivalent to around $405 today, to care for each baby. Cooney covered all the costs through the entrance fees. Why not? Presumably unaware that Cooney was not a qualified doctor, pediatricians began coming to the fairgrounds to collaborate with Cooney and study the babies in his care. And yet none of these qualified pediatricians were able to figure out that Cooney was not really a doctor. Fascinating. The distinguished Yale professor, pediatrician, and child development psychologist Arnold Gassell visited Cooney multiple times at the 1939 New York World's Fair. Gassell brought a camera in with him to film the babies in Cooney's facility. Interestingly, when Gassell wrote his book, The Embryology of Behavior, The Beginnings of the Human Mind, he avoided any mention of Cooney or the sideshow setting where he had carried out much of his research. By contrast, when in 1922, Hess wrote the first textbook on premature birth published in the U.S., Premature and Congenitally Deceased Infants, he wrote, I desire to acknowledge my indebtedness to Dr. Martin Cooney. Of all Cooney's professional associations, his friendship with Morris Fishbean, the controversial president, what else would it be, of the American Medical Association, no, those are two things you don't see side to side very often, if ever, is the most intriguing. Fishbean was the head of the AMA for 25 years and led the association's crusade against quack doctors. The two men were so close, Fishbean sent his aspiring medic son, Justin, to discuss his career with Cooney in New York. If he had been found out, Cooney could have faced a large fine and a lengthy prison sentence. Over the course of his nearly 50-year career, Cooney took in around 8,000 babies, of whom he claimed to have saved around 6,500. While there's no way of verifying the numbers, pediatricians today acknowledge that the team of doctors and nurses which Cooney assembled was highly skilled, ensuring the babies got the best care available in America at that time. Well, very interesting, and very interesting article overall. Now, let's get to the good part since we've looked at the baseline of what the mainstream tells us, and let's consider what's really going on with these incubator babies. What's really going on with this story? Why do we have all this attention on Dr. Cooney, and why did we review this article? We know that there are pieces of information that seem to be fact in the article. And what it seems to be happening is that Dr. Cooney is a lightning rod to draw our attention. Yet other pieces of information seem to be fact. The fact that there were numerous exhibitions for decades that showed these incubator babies. The fact that there seem to be medical teams all across the country, because supposedly everybody who had a premature birth, had to go through Dr. Cooney. There was nobody else. How does that make any sense? This is what we'd expect to see at the World's Fair exhibition, but this is what we actually see. Not a single incubator, but many incubators. Why do we see so many incubators when one, two, or three would be perfectly sufficient to showcase the capabilities of the equipment? Now, of course, we cover this by saying we want to show off babies. But that's the reality. They're not showing off the incubators. It's clear they're showing off the babies. Why are they showing off the babies? If you think about that and you think about what you see in this image, there are many infants and many incubators there for this little crowd of people to see. And it looks like we have a doctor who's given an overall account of what's going on to this little tour group, if you will. And we even see what appears to be a child there. What's the real story with these children? There's even accounts that there was a fire that endangered many of the babies, although they saved them all in the incubators at one of the World's Fairs in the 19-teens. And yet this didn't stop Dr. Cooney from doing this. What's the real situation with this? And Last why week is this we explored so ominous? the reality that there was a supposed labor shortage, especially in the Midwest of the United States, in the end of the 19th and the early 20th century. If that's true, then it seems there wasn't sufficient population to consider settling the rest of the United States. So what if these incubator babies are really babies that had been produced? And then that leads to additional questions. Well, where did these babies come from? And how were they able to bring so many of them in so quickly? It goes back to many different questions about the fact that we have photographic evidence that makes it very clear that they're not showcasing the incubators. They're showcasing the babies. And what was the true number of orphan train riders? We're told it's a quarter of a million. 
Yet there seemed to be indications that since it went on for so long, the number had to be much greater. What if there's a disparity in the number of babies who were in the incubators? We're told the number is 6,000, 8,000, but the article admits there's no way to know. Yet supposedly this was across the entire nation, this appeared in multiple world fairs, and this went on for decades. Do we really believe that number would only be six or 8,000? Or could it be far more? Consider the original concept behind the incubator. They tell us that it was started and invented in the 19th century and that prior to that, there was no way to care or save infants who were born prematurely. Well, was that its real intention? Or were these infants somehow produced in some areas that we don't know of? Or areas that remain secret to the general population? And then they were provided or transported to all of these locations at these World's Fairs and locations across what is now the United States for display and exhibition. Everyone always refers to the incubator babies of Coney Island, but it very much was not simply Coney Island. What exactly is that individual wearing right there? That does not seem like the attire I would expect to see somebody wearing in New York in the 19th or early 20th century. But perhaps one of you historians out there could correct me on what the proper attire was. It's an interesting picture, and it looks like we have three infants in that particular incubator. Well, what exactly is going on with that? Regardless, we understand that these incubators were everywhere. They were displayed everywhere. And there also seemed to be a lot of effort put into this. I also find it interesting that the sign here is a little bit more elaborate than what we typically see. And why does this picture seem strange? The actions of the people that are posing in this picture, and even the appearance of some of these people in this picture. Supposedly, this is from the early 1900s. Based on the era of dress, that's what we'd think, and those are more the hats I would expect to see in the United States. Either the top hat, or the classic version of the Panama hat, or even the little exhibition, or the expedition Smokey Bear hat. What exactly are we looking at? The gentleman, I think, who's holding the baby looks really strange. And then back on the sign itself, there seemed to be a lot of effort put into advertising this. And of course, you don't just see incubators. They weren't showcasing the equipment. They were showcasing the babies with the living infants. It seems as though this was designed to provide a selection or another alternative for labor and for repopulation. And we have many pictures like this. If these were the original mothers of these children, why would they ever allow them to be displayed like this? Even if Dr. Cooney had saved them. It just doesn't seem to match what we know of basic human social activity or the bond between a mother and the child. This almost seems like these are people who came and they were looking for children to pick up. They picked out their children and then they adopted them. We look at the many postcards and the images of the Cabbage Patch. And what's really the origin behind that? We're told that this is because people were uncomfortable about talking about such things as human reproduction in the 19th and the early 20th century, and so they used the Cabbage Patch and the Stork to explain it. However, it seems as though there's a much more ominous meaning behind it. The reality behind the Cabbage Patch, that this was a way that they were simply providing children when they needed to repopulate the area. And that the true process was a family, a couple, or who knows, perhaps even people who hadn't even gotten married yet, went around, looked at children in the incubators, and selected them. And this image is especially ominous because here we have the children riding on a train. All the symbolism being depicted in this postcard. It seems like it's very benign and joyful. However, when we look at it for what it truly represents and what it could represent, it takes on a very different meaning. The great difficulty in accepting the fact that this could be the reality of the existence of many lineages. 
And none of us wanted to accept that or even consider it. But what if it's even more ominous that they were redesigning humans? We have far too many accounts of giants in our history and our myth, and supposedly some have even claimed to have discovered giant's bones, although these finds are always contested and considered quote-unquote pseudoscience. And yet there's many historical records beyond myth of giants. Even Roman Emperor Maximinus Thrax, who was a historical figure, and based on the actual conversion of the Roman measurement, he would be 8 feet 6 inches tall. And that's not beyond the realm of consideration, because we have had human beings that have gotten over 8 feet tall that have been documented. Yet other evidence exists for even larger human beings. So what if the children from these incubators were redesigned human beings, either with some sort of process concerning DNA, or some sort of scientific process that we don't understand? Also consider that in the Bible, the decline in age is at death. You look far enough back in the Bible, and other religious texts of course, and it seems there are well documented cases of human beings living over 800 years. Yet as time went on, for some reason, the lifespan or life expectancy decreased immensely, down to 200 years. And what can we say it is now? 80? 85 if you're lucky? Depending where you live, of course, we'll be told that there's a different life expectancy, depending on nation, although what that has to do with it, I'm not sure. Yet that's what we're told. But what if the real answer, the potential changes in our human structure and our human lifespan, have to do with the actual redesigning of the human being. Perhaps through some process of alchemy that we don't understand, or some other scientific process that we're never going to be allowed to understand. It's a chilling consideration, and it's one of the reasons that this is a difficult topic to cover. Yet we have a lot of evidence, and a lot of accounts that indicate this may be the case. Think of the channel's exploration into the underground. When we think of the existing population of the civilization that came before ours, Tartaria, or call it whatever you want to, and the many bones that we have underground indicating that millions were killed. Somebody died down there, and then somebody arranged the bones like that, indicating there was some mass killing that occurred. We have many difficult terms for it now. And then we also consider the images that we have of different types of humans or human-like creatures, such as the Blimmies. Were they the result of some sort of genetic manipulation or tampering or alteration? And then, of course, there are many other creatures. And then we wonder even about the very plain disparity that we have in human beings today. Compared to this, the differences in human beings today is very, very minor. Also, when you take accounts in of other creatures that supposedly existed. Also, going back to the giants, here's Robert Wadlow from Alton, Illinois. Guinness Book of World Records is the tallest human being. The picture in the middle, some people contest saying it's fake, and yet that individual who appears to be in that coffin looks about to be as tall as Robert Wadlow. And then what about the skeleton to the right? Is that real or is that an altered image? Things suddenly become a lot more cloudy when we consider this, and we consider these conflicting accounts. Robert Waldo was very well documented. What about the rest of this? What about the myths and the stories that we have of different human beings in the past, and what about the myths and the stories that we have of giants, and of people having much longer lifespans? There's too many accounts of this to simply ignore. Of course, our mainstream will address this by saying that, no, everything we tell you is true. There were dinosaurs 65 million years ago, and that's not absurd. And yes, they were tremendously large creatures, and they lived on the land. So we can't use that old excuse that, well, we only have large creatures in the water, such as the blue whale, because that facilitates large creatures in the water. But we'll justify this by saying things were very different in the environment, and that's what facilitated the lifespan of large creatures such as these, with the size and mass that you couldn't possibly imagine. And isn't it funny how much we remember in school the way that they push dinosaurs on us, and even in fiction to this day, and science fiction being mixed with it. And we'll be told that this is a picture of an individual next to a dinosaur bone. 
But are we sure it's a dinosaur bone, or could that be a bone of anything, or could it be something else entirely? Remember that we just have a picture here. So what does this really tell us about these incubator babies? It seems clear that there was some more nefarious purpose by displaying all of these infants in all these different locations. Were they just displaying infants that you could select as part of a repopulation plan at a national or potentially international level? Who knows how widespread this was? Or were they introducing an altered human being into the existing population stocks? Can't really disprove that. Can't really prove it either. However, they're very interesting considerations. What do you think is really going on? Let me know in the comments. We're going to continue this exploration and we're going to try to answer the questions, whether it's through theory and conjecture based on available evidence, of how the situation came to be. Where did these babies come from? Where did the orphans on the orphan trains come from? And how did we end up in the situation after the last reset, whether it occurred in 1850 or a year that was much earlier? There's much more exploration that we have to complete, and we will with the 19th century in understanding how the situation came to be and looking for explanations of what happened to the civilization before us and how the reset was so effective. Finally, consider joining the channel as a member. You can be an explorer and receive early access to content, or you can be a prime explorer and have exclusive content that you can't watch on the regular channel. As always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you'll restore the world. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for joining me today.